Senhoras e senhores, estamos chegando então ao final, ao último keynote do dia. Então, para a última palestra do Simpósio 2015, eu convido então o nosso CEO global novamente para endereçar as palavras finais aí para todos nós, Brian Chung. All right, well, we made it to the very end of Symposium uh, 2015. And I actually just want to take a brief chance to say thank you again to the wonderful team here in Liferay Brazil who made this possible. Um, I don't know all the names of all the people, but uh, I think it would be enough to say that Pedro Cabral was uh, instrumental in making this happen. So let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Well, it's exciting to see a lot of the technologies that our team uh, at Liferay have been producing, as well as what's going on in the wider industry. I think Zeno is one of the best uh, people to speak about those things and to really uh, challenge us to change the world uh, using technology. Um, now, not all of us here are technologists, and I know uh, myself being now more on the business side, uh, sometimes you feel helpless and you feel like, uh, all of the power is in the hands of the developers and, and you can only kind of bribe them with wine and chocolate or whatever it takes to get them to help you uh, with your business goals. But uh, uh, to, to close the conference, I wanted to uh, sort of take a step back and present a different perspective that maybe it's not always about technology, that uh, ultimately there are things that you as decision makers, as business influencers can do to make a difference. So um, I will start to say uh, first that technology, of course, is vitally important. Uh, it enables us to do new things that were not possible before. And to illustrate this point, I wanted to take an example from the world of photography. Uh, you may know that I'm, I'm quite uh, interested in photography in my personal life and uh, you know, take a lot of photos. And I read a story uh, about this photographer. His name is Vincent Lafore. And he was talking about a project that he did where he was uh, taking photos of cities from, uh, from the air. And the reason how that came about was um, one day he had his newest, uh, latest digital SLR, and he realized uh, when he took a photo at a dark uh, corner uh, way over there, all he saw was black. But when he took the photo and then looked at the preview, he saw that there were actually uh, green bushes with red berries there. And in that moment, um, he found that digital technology now surpassed his own human capabilities of vision. And he, and he, and he realized that this was a new era for him. And um, as a result of this, um, he decided to see how the, the photographic lens might change the way that he can look at cities. And this is the result of that. Um, you can find uh, his work uh, online. Uh, just search for Vincent Lafaure. It's quite famous now. Uh, but just some breathtaking and stunning landscapes of cities that we all know and love um, that uh, kind of paint them in a new light and show them in a new perspective. And this is something that was not possible uh, before the latest uh, advances in digital photography. And so likewise in business, uh, we see a lot of things that maybe other companies are doing. Maybe uh, when you see Everest's case studies uh, from yesterday morning, you wish that you could do something similar uh, in uh, your company. You think, oh, I got to get on the cloud. I need to get Amazon Web Services. And you know, I need to be on mobile right away, right? Um, or you know, when you see the Agrobotics case study, your first reaction might be, I need to have those drones, right? Um, and you know, just, just a personal confession, uh, when I saw the uh, Fiat booth, um, I was very, very impressed. And um, I you know, immediately thought, I need to get a 3D printer as well, right? So technology definitely matters, but uh, I want to show you that it doesn't matter as much as we think it sometimes does. And to do that, I want to give you a case study from a country which while is technologically advanced in the world of gadgets, is not always the uh, leader in IT. And even among them, one of the most sort of traditional businesses uh, is retail and uh, convenience stores. And this is a story about 7-Eleven in Japan and how they were able to undertake this uh, very revolutionary, innovative, big data technology uh, 
project to understand their customers. So just so you understand, um, I don't think we have 7-Eleven as much here in Brazil. We do have it in the US, uh, but it's not quite as prevalent even in the US where it originated as it is in Japan. Uh, this is a Google map where if you search for 7-Eleven, you can see just how widely it covers the country of Japan. In fact, you can compare it to the number of post offices, and you can see that they actually cover more uh, than, the, than the government does with the post office. So they're kind of everywhere. And they decided they wanted to understand their customers' buying habits, their preferences, and so they wanted to gather that customer information. So what's our first reaction? Well, we need scanners, maybe we need like Internet of Things and all this stuff, right? Um, but what was their secret weapon? They took stock of what they had, they looked at the existing resources, and they used the most obvious thing. So what 7-Eleven did was they instructed all of their sales clerks, every time someone approaches the counter and they buy something, you're gonna be scanning the items so we know exactly what they're buying, but we want you to also say, is it a male or a female? About how old are they? and then just quickly punch into that information as you do the transaction. And so basically, using uh, this very low-tech uh, process, they were able to collect seven billion pieces of data, and using that information, now they're able to tailor everything in their stores, their, uh, their stock, their inventory, toward the most popular and the most uh, widely purchased items, uh, not just nationally, but on a neighborhood by neighborhood business. So even within the city of Tokyo, in the places with uh, more of the younger clientele, you're gonna get a different set of uh, products than the wealthier parts where maybe there are, are more families and so forth. And uh, the, the most interesting thing about this story um, is that I first read about it uh, on the internet um, and found out that it was included in this book which was called The Harvard Design School Guide to Shopping, which is published 13 years ago, in 2002, before we even knew what big data was, right? So I think it tells us two things. First of all, uh, like I said, you don't have to have the latest, greatest technology. But second of all, there's a lot that you can do when you've got uh, sort of the will and the imperative from the business side to get something done. Um, the other thing that I learned from this case study is that technology is important because it is ultimately a way to interface and to reach your customer, right? The reason why we care about web, the reason why we care about mobile is because it helps us reach our customers in new ways. And sometimes you can take stock of the things that you already have and you realize that there's all these ways to already reach your customers and we're not using it uh, in the way that uh, we can most fully. For 7-Eleven, this, having full retail coverage of Metropolitan in Tokyo is one of the best interfaces that they could have uh, thought of. And of course, using their clerks is, is also a really great idea. And why do we care about reaching our customers? Ultimately, it's because we want to delight the customer, right? And sometimes, delighting the customer means having the best technologies available. Uh, things like the Disney Magic Wristband delights the customer, right? And, you know, so, so sometimes you have to do that, but sometimes uh, the most delightful things are, are quite old-fashioned because, you know, we can't all hang outside of a helicopter like Vincent LaFerre to take all our photos, right? Uh, but something, sometimes something as simple as a Polaroid camera, uh, which is very clear and obvious in how to use it, uh, is gonna lead to the most memorable human experiences. Uh, this was certainly true for me personally. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a very big uh, enthusiast for taking photos, but out of you know, 20,000 digital photos that I've, I've taken in my life, um, I have one photo that sits uh, in my house on the countertop, and it's the one that I took with our uh, French general manager last June with his Polaroid camera. So delighting the customer, creating memorable human experiences um, is ultimately the goal of technology, and so you should choose the correct technology or the absence of it when it can delight, the uh, when it can delight your customers. Um, so as you know, if you've been part of the Liferate community for a long time, 
Uh, Liferay tries to be on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, we started as a company in 2004, but our history starts in 2000 when uh, Brian Chan, who is a different person, by the way, so if you took a photo with me hoping it was Brian Chan, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just a body double. Um, but uh, he started this open source software technology in 2000, and we started the company together as friends in 2004. And um, I actually have no point to make with this, except that I wanted to show embarrassing photos of our friends here in Brazil. Um, we started Liferay Brazil, uh, I think in 2007 or 2008. Um, at that time, both uh, Thiago Moreira and uh, Bruno Farage were first starting to use Liferay technology. And uh, you know, they started to email us and, and start a relationship with us. And then ultimately, that led to the foundation of Liferay Brazil, which has led to the success of Liferay in the South American market. Um, what you may not know is that these guys, I mean, they weren't always so cool, right? Um, well, Tiago looks pretty cool. Eduardo looks kind of like a scared rabbit. And uh, Bruno looks pretty much the way he's always looked. Um, a little bit like a terrorist. Um, this was when uh, Bruno came to uh, our uh, Life Ray retreat in, in 2011, I believe, uh, just having fun. But uh, one of the things, so obviously technology is this great thing, and it's united us. It's made it possible for, have, for us to have relationships with people in faraway places and to build a business. But it's not about technology, right? And sometimes when you look around the conference, when you meet the people, when you get the stickers that say, you know, nerds forever or whatever, you think, oh yeah, it's really about technology. But uh, I'm here to share with you about the, the real vision and purpose behind Lifer as a company. So this year we uh, had a chance to really reflect. It had been 10 years of being a company and we realized that there's a lot of value in having sort of a vision statement written down in words. Um, I personally always believed it was something that every life rate person knew uh, inside of them. Um, it was a living, breathing thing, and I, I still believe it is. Uh, but sometimes it's really a lot easier to communicate and share when you put it in words. So uh, after a lot of uh, kind of back and forth and really thinking about what the essence is of our culture, this is what we came up with. Uh, we want to see people, not just in life rate, not just our customers, but people around the world uh, reach their full potential. Um, and this is a pretty common sentiment in the world today. Um, and so we didn't want to stop there because, you know, you could have a dictator who says, I want to reach my full potential, right? Um, but if you're not doing it to serve others, to make other people's lives better, uh, to add back into uh, society in some way, then you've only done a, a certain limited part of the vision. So uh, our full vision is for people to reach the full potential to serve other people. And so that makes a lot of things make sense for us. Uh, when you look at our approach to open source software, when you look at uh, some of the cool things Eduardo and Zeno are, are building with Launchpad, one of the reasons why they did that was because they realized that for some developers uh, in the world, JavaScript developers, which is a hugely growing population, they were not reaching their full potential as developers using old library portal technology because Java and portlets and app servers and all of this stuff uh, was suitable for the enterprise environment, uh, but maybe it wasn't helping JavaScript developers to reach their full potential. So as a company, we decided, yes, this is something important. We want to uh, really reach these developers with a valuable uh, technology so that they can build cool things that then help their customers do whatever it is that they need to do to help other people. So, I want to make that clear because uh, in the past we've talked a lot about our employee volunteer program. We've talked about how we'll send people to places like, uh, uh, I think, Guatemala to build wells, or how here uh, uh, in uh, Pernambuco we've had uh, Clady, who's been helping with, uh, with one of the uh, public schools and teaching computers and software. And that's a very important and vital part of our culture. But we think it's just an a important but small part, right? Um, we believe the business itself and the technology itself is our primary way of fulfilling the vision to see people reach their full potential to serve other people, right? And so that's also a lot of the motivation between Life Ray 7. 
uh, when Juan Hidalgo and the team, the UX team at LifeRay, wanted to improve the interface of LifeRay, we realized uh, a lot of people had trouble actually using LifeRay, and it was really important to do this uh, so that people would uh, fulfill more of their potential using LifeRay technology. Now, I have to admit uh, that we're not always the best at doing it. I mean, some of our error messages are, are so confounding, and uh, whether it's for the end user or for the developer. So this is something that we're constantly working on, but it is our heart, right? So um, I want to share one last example, one last story uh, that really, I think, illustrates what we hope to achieve in the field of business and technology. Um, again, it's from a completely unrelated field, which I'm personally interested in, um, and that's the field of architecture. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this man. His name is Shigeru Ban, and he's a world-famous architect. He won the uh, Pritzker Prize in Architecture in 2014. And like a lot of architects uh, active in the 21st century, he has built his fair share of sort of very grandiose um, kind of statement buildings for, for wealthy clientele like the Centre Pompidou in France. Um, you know, he's built things like this uh, curtain house in Tokyo, which are highly conceptual in nature. Um, but his actual heart is to really think about sustainable architecture, uh, and particularly for how to help disaster victims. Um, just, just mentioning that he was also um, the architect who built the uh, temporary pavilion in front of the uh, Brazil embassy in uh, Tokyo uh, during the World Cup uh, uh, of last year. Um, so uh, someone who's also familiar to the Brazilian community. But um, his real passion is about how architects can make a difference in uh, disaster scenarios. And so uh, he's gone to places like Haiti, uh, to India, to China after the uh, earthquake in Sichuan, uh, and even Christchurch, New Zealand after their earthquake. Uh, this is a particularly beautiful example uh, of a cathedral called the Paper Cathedral um, that he was able to quickly build uh, right after the uh, earthquake so that people could resume worshiping. Um, this was uh, another place he built in uh, Italy after an earthquake where um, I think in the city of Aquila, uh, the uh, performance of, of music was a vital part of their culture. And so he wanted to help that community uh, get back as quickly as possible to normal life by building this symphony hall. So uh, one of the ways that he has helped uh, more local to himself is in the area where the tsunami happened in 2011. Um, I had a chance in April with our employee volunteer project to visit uh, Onagawa. It's a small town um, in the northeast of Japan. You can just imagine because, see all this water here, this is the harbor, and this is all basically Pacific Ocean, right? Um, so all of that tsunami water basically funneled in and struck into the main downtown area, which was situated right around that harbor. Um, and so basically, I mean, this photo is from, uh, I think, a few uh, weeks afterwards when things had been cleaned up, um, but the whole town was devastated. All of this land used to be occupied by the downtown buildings. So Mr. Bunn, being a world-renowned architect uh, with a great sense of style, with a great uh, heart uh, for this kind of a situation, uh, he actually came in and built a new train station for the community of Onagawa. It's not something that's only altruistic, so even though he actually donated his time and other organizations donated the materials um, to get this built, he didn't do it in a shoddy way, right? And in the same way, when uh, people look at LifeRay, they sometimes say, well, it's open source software, so you know, maybe it's buggy and it doesn't work that well, but at least it's free, right? Uh, we never want to be that way. We never want to say that just because we're open source, we're going to build an inferior quality software. Um, we actually believe that open source is the best way to build software. It leads to higher quality, and that's one of the reasons why we've chosen to be open source. Uh, but our goal as an organization is to be world leaders in technology and business uh, and not to cut corners or to be second class. So this is what it looks like on the inside. It even has a public bath. Um, and he has also had the chance to build these temporary shelters. Um, it looks pretty uh, chaotic on the outside, but um, I think one thing you may not realize is that these actually use uh, shipping containers uh, so that the materials for building the shelter is actually in the containers. You can take it out and then assemble it really quickly. 
And he also partnered with an interior design company called Muji um, to create actually a pretty beautiful uh, calming space even for temporary housing. In fact, I feel like it almost looks better than my own house that I live in. Um, <laughs> When, uh, when Shigeru Ban received the Pritzker Prize uh, for Architecture in 2014, he was giving it, uh, an interview, and he was talking about his motivation. And he basically said uh, that what makes him happy is when people use his buildings, they actually enjoy them, um, and, 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 and that's what gives him the greatest satisfaction. And I want to draw that parallel to Liferay as well. Um, we get excited when you're excited about Launchpad, about screens, about audience targeting, all these things that we've been working so hard on. Uh, we don't want to just build it for ourselves. We don't want to geek out on technology and say, oh, look at me, I can write uh, you know, enterprise apps in JavaScript. No, it's, it's, are we helping you solve your problems? Are we building something that makes your life easier? Because if not, then there's no point in doing uh, what we're doing. So, Again, I want to say thank you uh, for all of your support, uh, for being here for the last two or three days, uh, for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you, uh, both in the terms of you making it possible for us to be successful, but also for giving us purpose. Um, if the work that we do doesn't ultimately help put smiles on your faces, and I know this is mainly because of free beer and wine, um, but I hope you're also happy about uh, the products and services we build for you. Uh, please tell us how we can serve you better, um, how we can do more, uh, basically, to fulfill our vision to see you also reach your full potential in serving others. Thank you very much. So, we reached the end of the Life for Symposium 2015. Mais uma vez, eu gostaria de agradecer imensamente aos nossos patrocinadores. Agradeço o nome da Liferay, sem vocês isso não seria possível. Primeiramente, o patrocinador Platinum dessa edição do simpósio, a Everest Brasil. Em seguida, os patrocinadores Gold, Dynatrace, Intel de Brasil, GM5 e FIAP. E aos patrocinadores Silver, Oracle, MySQL, Debold e Verity. São empresas que investem na nossa plataforma, que acreditam na nossa solução e que, melhor ainda, têm desenvolvido soluções incríveis para os seus clientes. Agradeço também, acima de tudo, ao staff da Life Latin America. É, muito obrigado, Brian, por falar, enfim, por me agradecer, mas na verdade foi um trabalho conjunto. Marketing muitas vezes está na ponta da lança, mas sem a lança nada é possível. Então, uma salva de palmas para o staff da Life Ray. E é isso. Então, muito obrigado a todos e até o simpósio 2016, então. Obrigado.